begin my uh, words this morning with a reading by uh, David Bumbaugh. David Bumbaugh is a contemporary UU minister whose spirituality is largely based in the splendor of the natural world. And uh, the passage that I'm about to read comes from his sermon entitled, Basic Generic October Sermon. (laughs) White clouds move over a blue October sky, casting drifting shadows across the landscape, filling me with a sense of the indescribable power and majesty, the aching wordless glory of the world in which I find myself. More than the aphorisms of any of the great teachers, the beauty of the world which is our mother and our home draws out of me a recognition of the finitude of my own existence and the infinity of the process in which it is rooted, and an affirmation of the holiness of life and existence. October is a strange month. It doesn't even have the right name. It seems to be constantly moving from was to is to will be, from summer to autumn to winter. Its message seems to be that behind the appearance of things, There is a process at work which is full of hidden purpose and unspoken meaning. Its message seems to be that we are part of and carried along by that purpose. Bumba continues, in many ways this is the heart of my faith and the heart of the message I have sought to proclaim. Look behind the obvious, behind the customary, behind the accumulated, encrusted habits of our lives and there, disguised as a quiet October day, hidden beneath the fall of acorns and the play of squirrels, is a source of power and strength to lend our lives purpose and meaning and power, power to shape out of quotidian reality a brief eternal moment of glowing truth and speechless glory. Seize that moment, embrace it as if it were eternity, for it is, and there discover the means to shape yourself a life worthy of the holy power which lies deep within you. As far as seasons go, fall is hard to beat. I am going to be partisan here for a little bit. Winter, winter has its share of critics. It's too cold, it's too gray, it's too dark. And summer also, it's too hot, too humid, too mosquito-y. Spring, spring is well-loved, but it's loved for what it's not. Hallelujah. Things are not as cold and dark as they were. (laughs) Spring is indistinct. It's just an immature version of the summer. But fall, fall is unique and distinct. It is its own. Fall wins. It's got it going on. (laughs) At least that's my opinion, which, which is, of course, the right opinion. The first meeting I had with the members of the worship ministry team here, we went around the room and and I invited the the members of that team to each speak from the heart, saying what it was that the autumn season meant to them. And the sharing was, was deep and profound and poignant. There was an awareness in this moment of turnings, an awareness of mortality. For a few members, Autumn brought up the, the memory of a love and a loss that this season made them feel once more. Others rejoiced, rejoiced in the glory of the fall, its beauty. Autumn, as the members of the worship team told me, is in fact a season of turning turning from warm to chill, from light to dark, from life to death. But fall doesn't hide its own inevitable dying. It doesn't shrink away or pretend that's not what's going on. Rather, it shows off. Here is fiery red and orange and yellow. If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. Here is pumpkin and apple 
sweet and spicy and crisp. There is a sweetness to this moment. There is a sweetness of now, despite the barrenness of time to come. Forest Church famously defined religion as our human response to the dual reality of being alive and knowing that we must die. Our human response to the dual reality of being alive and knowing that we must die. How should we spend the one life we've been given? Wisely and well, for it is a finite gift. Fall knows it must die so it lives whatever time it has left to its fullest. There's an old Buddhist story that reminds me of the finitude of life and of the importance of being fully present to the life that is being lived right now, right in this very moment. So in this Buddhist story, there is a monk who is taking a walk through the forest, and the monk comes to realize that he is being followed by a tiger. It's obviously not a, not a good thing. So he kind of gets running, gets running, and comes to a cliff tiger on his heels. And fortunately, there is a rope hanging off of the cliff. Aha, he says, and he climbs down the rope. made it, escaped that tiger. And he's feeling pretty happy and pretty, um, pretty uh, relieved until he looks down and sees that at the bottom of the cliff there is a second tiger waiting. Tiger above, tiger below, the monk looks to the side and sees a tiny green plant growing in the side of the cliff. A strawberry plant growing out of the cliff face. And the plant has one perfect strawberry on it. Reaching out, plucking the strawberry, the monk exclaims, Life is sweet. I don't know about you, but I don't always have an easy time accepting life's finitude. I don't always have an easy time being present enough to enjoy the sweetness of now. Let me give you a fairly superficial example of, of what I mean by this. I am, as many of you know, I'm a big reader. I read a lot of books. I, I practice what, what uh, one Unitarian Universalist has told me is salvation by bibliography. And in my, in my early years as a, as a minister, lots of my parishioners would recommend books to me, and so I decided to keep a spreadsheet, color-coded, of all of the books that I thought I should really get around to reading someday. I've got this on my, on my computer. It's a spreadsheet. It's 600 books long at this point. Um, and it's, I've come here, and uh, people have been meeting me and in the church and saying, oh, here's this book you really ought to read, and here's this book you really ought to read. So the list is getting longer, faster than it's getting shorter. Um, and, of course, of course, there is a, there is a, a joy, there is a, there is a sweetness in, in being able to sort, of, to sort of love these books, and yet there is also this, this foreboding sense of, of one's own finitude, knowing that, that this list is, is insurmountable, unfinishable. There's no, there's no way it will never, everything will ever be read. The author David Foster Wallace gets this point about life's finitude when he writes, day to day I have to make all sorts of choices about what is good and important and fun, and then I have to live with the forfeiture of all the other options those choices foreclose. And I'm starting now to see how as time gains momentum, my choices will narrow and their foreclosures will multiply exponentially until I arrive at just one point on some branch of life's sumptuous branching complexity. That's finitude, right? Being alive while knowing we must die, what David Bumba calls 
an eternal moment of glowing truth and speechless glory within a recognition of the finitude of my own existence, the strawberry on the cliffside, the sweetness of now. It's been quite a week, hasn't it? Thirteen new states joining the ranks of marriage equality. How sweet this moment. And I have to tell you that there is a part of my personality, a part of my personality that looks at that infinite list on the spreadsheet in my mind and says, it would be better if we didn't celebrate for too long. We've still got 15 states left to go. And of course, there's also racism and sexism and poverty and warfare and disease and, and, and carbon emissions. And you could create your own list. You could create your own list. But what does it mean to actually be able to stop and savor the sweetness of now on an autumn morning? In the Christian tradition, um, there is a practice called communion, which most of us know how, it, how it's practiced um, with, uh, with, with, bread and, with bread and wine. Um, but I actually think of all through the, the Gospels, all through the tradition, that, that there is, are stories, stories of people actually stopping to celebrate and to rejoice and to be present and mindful to joy while putting the laundry list, the spreadsheet of complaints and criticisms on hold for just a moment to be present. I think the wedding of Cana is an example of that and the, the story of the um, follower of Jesus who broke the jar of um, of perfume and oil and and anointed with it when others were saying, well, you, know, you could you could sell that and make a lot of money and then you could do more good with that and well, listen with no, we, there is an importance of savoring the sweetness of now and enjoying what is. So what we're about to hold here is something that that you've never done before unless you were at the first service this morning. Um, we're about to do um, a tradition that I that I came up with. I'm bringing bringing here called the fall apple communion. Um, it is a, a celebration of the sweetness of now. As someone at the first service remarked, it's like they thought, they thought it was like Eden communion. It was like, here, everybody, come take a, a part of the, uh, the, the tree of knowledge and, and enjoy that, and, which is an interesting, uh, an interesting theory about it. And I didn't, I didn't think of that when I came up with it. So what we're going to do um, is I'm going to ask for a, for a volunteer. I'm going to ask for, for someone to be, to be my acolyte. Um, and what that involves is, is I've got this, this big platter here. I'm going to hold the platter, but somebody's going to need to fish out um, toothpicks. We're not gonna, I'm not going to actually put the apple in your mouth. That's, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, but we're going to come forward, and I invite you to take an apple um, and to enjoy it and to savor its sweetness, its presence right here and right now.